No. Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Stacy. Is it really snowy there, or is that just your picture? Oh, that was just a picture from a few weeks ago. It hey, is like 40 out now. Yeah, it's suddenly spring ish. Yeah. yeah. Or, or yeah. full spring. Hey, Ryan. Hello, Christina, Adam. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's good to see you. Kartik, you shared. Do you want us to? Uh, it's just a link of the slides I'll be showing today. So Okay. Awesome. So are we waiting for Narsim or you want to get started anyway? Because he already knows your work. I hope so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> maybe maybe he'll be surprised. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can we can get straight to it. Uh, okay. I think today was just meant to be a discussion about how. You know, the rest of us would be using the data set that I've been developing. So I just have a couple of slides just sort of giving a brief overview of the data set. And then we can sort of just get into the discussion of you know, what we can do with it, what everybody else wants to do with it. So I won't talk about what I've been doing because you know I've had a couple of meetings discussing that. So I won't get into any of my results, but just sort of describing you know, the, the data set itself. So sort of the motivation for developing this data set was trying to understand you know, like a multi-dimensional insecurity poverty perspective. So just trying to understand all the different aspects of a household that could be affecting their well-being. So definitely energy is one of the bigger themes that we have. But then in the process of developing this data set, we've also looked at other insecurities that could sort of affect the household's well-being. So including housing, food, travel, and health. So and each of these variables come from you know, dedicated surveys. And we've used this fusion ACS package to sort of, to sort of bring all of these variables onto the same platform. So that's sort of the approach we've taken. And then in this particular figure, I just have you know subjective well-being at the center because my work has mostly been trying to see what how your overall life quality is sort of affected by these different pockets. But it doesn't have to be that way, like because we could just focus on energy like we've been doing, having conversations for quite some time now. So the reason I have subjective well-being in the center is just because the way I've sort of thought about this, but doesn't you know doesn't have to be that way. So, yeah. So what we have after running, uh, you know, these models is this data set, which looks like any other micro data that uh, one would work with. So you have variables of interest coming in from different dedicated surveys. So, for example, from the energy survey, we have energy consumption numbers. So this would be, for example, uh, electricity consumption, natural gas consumption. And on top of that, we also have things like device ownership. So you know, how many ACs in the house, uh, what kind of equipment and things like that. And similarly, we could in theory pull in any variable uh, from any of these dedicated surveys. 
So for example, if you were to look at the consumption consumer expenditure survey, so we could pull out variables for housing costs, for example. So how much do you spend on improving your house, on your furniture? So like a lot of categories sort of sit in there. So, and then we would analyze all of these similar similar to the way you'd analyze any other micro data. You could run regressions, you could just do means, medians, modes, things like that. So uh, on the next slide, I've just included this data dictionary link so that you could just, this is a CSV file of all the variables that we have right now in the data set. So you could just download that and just sort of scroll through that and then kind of get a sense of what what we have in there. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of what's on the slide, the different kind of variables, and then we can sort of just jump to uh, discussing these things in a little more detail. So the way I've been thinking about this is we have a bunch of well-being indicators based on different, if you want to call it schools of thought. So for example, in the data set, we have a lot of subjective indicators. So these would be your overall quality of life uh, type variables. So your life satisfaction scores on the scale of one to 10. And you know, if you've been feeling happy, if you've been feeling stressed, how do you rate your neighborhood? How do you rate your house and things like that? So a lot of subjective indicators are in there. And then we also have the more traditional, yes, income and expenditure variables. So we have gross income and post-tax income, and you have a lot of expenditure variables in there, again, broken down by just different household categories, right? So you have energy, health, transportation, uh, you name it, I think it's just a pretty comprehensive list of uh, all the expenditure variables. And a couple of other special indicators, in my opinion, that you wouldn't find elsewhere are the subjective indicators. So for example, rather than looking at just consumption as an objective number, like you know, megawatt hours consumed in a year or something like that, you could also ask people how they feel about uh, the energy services and goods that they're receiving. So you know if they if they've received any disconnections or do they fear that they're going to get disconnected and then they won't have, you know, heating through the winter, questions like that. So subjective questions that wouldn't usually show up in other data sets. We also have a lot of those in there and not just energy. We have these subjective questions, uh, you know, for food and housing. So for example, you know, if people, if people would consider their housing to be adequate or not. So the questions like that as well, which are just purely subjective and not, which may or may not reflect uh, other objective criteria, like are there actually leaks in the house? Do they have drafty windows and things like that? So that's the extent of indicators. And then I have a bunch of heterogeneity factors here, which I've just broken them down into a lot of social demographics, housing characteristics, uh, geography so in geography we right now we can summarize the data at the puma level so there's, so there's about 42 pumas in colorado so that's a 42 number here and then for a few select variables we can go down to the track level so that's about uh 1250 tracks uh in uh, in colorado as well and then one sort of thing that we cannot do in some sense is looking at time dependence because we don't have a longitudinal data set. So all of these are just year-wise uh, ACS uh, surveys. So we don't really track individuals or households over time. So if you were to add a time component to all of this, that would be at an aggregate level. So for example, you could look at uh, how has the equipment age changed in a puma over time, so things like that. So we cannot really track if a particular household has you know, changed their equipment or not and things like that. So that's something that we cannot do uh, in some sense with the data set. So I'll just three final notes and then I'll sort of uh, end there. So one first note is, yes, this is a synthetic data set. So we do want to be very clear about that and how 
we sort of try to use other validation methods to make sure that the variables we produce here are of reasonable quality. And then, yes, Alison, you have a question. I think you just said it's a synthetic data set. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I guess I'm confused. I, um, for lack of a better term, I think of synthetic as made up, but I thought these data are actual ACS data. So can you help me understand what what you mm -hmm. mean by synthetic? Yeah, so if I just go back. So yes, so, so this is what the data set looks like, right? So you have the ACS variables, which are, well, for lack of a better word, real. So you have, these are real responses of, you know, income, race, occupation. And the way we get data from the other surveys, so for example, Rex is through the matching process, right? So you have a Rex 2020, which is a real survey, and then we match uh, variables between Rex and ACS and sort of simulate responses for, uh, for how these ACS respondents would have answered questions from the Rex survey just based on this matching process. So the variables that we have here are simulated responses. And that is the reason why, you know, it is a synthetic data set and not actual responses. So for example, the Rex in its original form is 20,000 respondents and the ACS is 1.1 you know, million respondents. So you're sort of, well, simulating 1.1 responses based on what we have. Okay, yeah, I From think I follow it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I've struggled with this word synthetic also, and I, I know what you mean, but I think, and, and it probably has a specific meaning in statistics or something. Mm -hmm. But I think if I were to communicate that to somebody else, then I'd have to go through a whole lot of explanation. Um, and I think similarly, what Zara has been using, the res stock, that's a synthetic data set. But it's based on an awful lot of input and constraint. So maybe one question is, um, there's, there's some uncertainty involved in the simulated responses. Are you taking that into account and how? Right, so we do take uh, uncertainty into account. The way we do this is we make multiple copies of the simulation process. So what in reality, what we have is this data set multiplied 40 times. So you have, and then you take a pooled average and all the other bars come from the pooling process of these 40 different copies. So in that way, you're sort of capturing uh, the error bar that happens because of the uncertainty in this uh, matching process. Could I just add to that? Um, this is a, these are 40 random draws from a distribution. So these are probability distributions for each imputed value because there's uncertainty around it. So there's this machine learning algorithm that's using the matching between uh, the, the set of variables that are the same between the ACS and the donor survey. And then using a machine learning algorithm is predicting what the ACS respondent based on those matching variables would have, would have, would, would have responded. And obviously that's a probability and so there are, it's actually a distribution of values that that respondent may have answered. And then you take draws from that so that you have uncertainty bars. So it is very, very similar to the rest talk synthetic data set in that sense, where they have a large underlying data set and they have some algorithm by which they're coming up with quote unquote synthetic. I mean, I don't think it's very complicated. The synthetic just means imputed. It's imputed. Yeah. You know, based based on what uh, whatever algorithm has been selected, and you can see the uncertainty bounds. And as with any uh, predictive process, the more sample set, the bigger your sample size, the lower your uncertainty. You know, and and you know we've done I think in previous presentations shown all different validation processes. Um, 
matching totals at a aggregate level, matching against external data on utility bills, you know. Um, and so there's a fair amount of work done to make sure this is not random. I mean, it's definitely not random. Yeah, and just yeah. to give an example of what Nasima is describing. So for example, if you have a question about energy insecurity, that's like yes and no, and it's a 0.9 probability of saying yes, and 0.1 probability of saying no. So that would be captured in these 40 copies. So you'd have 36 responses, the 40 copies that say yes, and then four that say no. So when you're sort of, you know, summarize it, you have 0.9 and 0.1. So you're sort of capturing the probability in this distribution. So I, I want to um, not go too much into this uncertainty because I agree you've presented the methods before um, because I, I really want to talk about how the team can draw on this resource and different methods of doing that. Um, but I, I will say, and I, I'm not saying this to be um, critical or provocative, but as a lay person, when I when I ask what it means and you say, I just made 40 copies of my data set and we use machine learning, it gives me no, <laughs> it does not add to my mm -hmm. confidence. <laughs> and, and so just a, maybe a note for, for presentation purposes, I have confidence in what you've done. I know you were very careful about it, but I think that the, the communication um, to describe its value could, could be um, enhanced. So yeah, oh, uh, moving on with the notes. So yeah, so there's the synthetic data set part and then the other value is this idea of multidimensionality because now we have variables sort of coming in from different surveys and then you could talk about households that you know facing food and energy insecurity at the, at the same time, for example. So we have the ability to sort of create a lot of these variables. And then, as I was saying earlier, there's also a lot of subjective variables that are perhaps not available in you know, the other data sets. So asking people directly about how they feel about the quality of service that you know, they get. So yeah, I'll just leave it at that. And then you can get more reactions from everybody else. Yeah, Ryan, you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask my question I put in the chat. So oh. assuming, well, like, what is the, like, level of variability less left? At, oh, I think uh, <laughs> someone just responded. Uh, but, like, if you do this well enough, essentially, at some point, space won't matter, right, would be my assumption, because you've captured all the variability, and then your space becomes air term. Um, do you think that's true? Or are you like, no, we actually need these at a finer grain scale than we have spatially? I mean, we know going from the Puma to the track level, I think there is a lot of variability that we need uh, like other methods to do that final downscaling step. So that's something that we're working on right now. So, I mean, you're right that we could add, keep adding more and more spatial predictors. Uh, but I think we're not confident enough to go down to the track level with the existing set up so yeah i think yeah. puma is where i think yeah we would we are stopping with with what we have currently but i guess my question is so like when you look at those puma level estimates assuming you have like your socio-demographic and housing characteristics like how much variability do you have left there because to me that variability is then things that aren't really captured by those variables does that make sense hmm Yeah, I mean, yes, but I don't know how much it, it probably varies from Puma to Puma. So I cannot give you yeah, a direct answer without actually looking at you know the specific Puma and seeing how much so the error bar is for. It, it, I mean, it depends on the variable itself too, right? So I'm guessing things like energy, like electricity consumption is perhaps not too bad, but I'm guessing if you slice it too fine, if you do energy consumption by race 
and by building type, maybe then you're running into like larger error bars. But again, I'll have to we'll have to do the exact analysis to sort of see what the error bar is looking like. Could I help out <clears throat> with this uh, question as well? Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I mean, everything Karthik said is right, but I specifically, it depends on the donor variable. So if the variable is one that is influenced by a spatially uh, dependent factor, so for example, something that depends on climate, right? Then socioeconomic variables would not fully capture the spatial heterogeneity, right? So, or it could be aspects of the built environment that are influencing uh, the outcome variable, in which case, again, that would be different for the same socioeconomic slice in different geographies because the nature of the urban environment is different or the nature of infrastructure provision is different. Access to a bus station may not be there to the same kinds of demographic in one location versus another, urban versus rural. So definitely for some variables, the spatial is very important. Uh, if you're looking at air pollution, you know, uh, and you're looking at the coincidence of air pollution with a bunch of social demographic economic variables and context, like infrastructure context, you will see spatial heterogeneity beyond. But on the other, but but having said that, I think what you're saying is true. You would capture a lot of that if you just had the right grouping of socio demographic economic variables, but you don't know what those are, right? It's hard to know how you should group such that you then pretty much capture heterogeneity. That's a very difficult exercise and it would differ for every variable you choose that you're interested in. Yeah. But I think it's a relevant question for our work in terms of, you know, we're thinking about heterogeneity in terms of how people make decisions at home. And it matters to us to try and figure that out a little bit. And one could do some, you know, we don't have in this particular data set, a set of decisions that have been made for heat pump adoption that we could then run a regression on, right? Um, Christina's work allows you to do that with some limited set of variables because we do, and she has done that. And, you know, we can talk about that actually. It's interesting with some of our results, but I hope that answers yeah, your question. That helps. Thank you both. And also just to add to that, uh, in terms of the social demographics, like the process itself is sort of blind in some sense because we throw everything at it in a sense that when we do the matching process, it is not that for certain variables, we leave out certain matching groups, right? So, so we let sort of the process decide which one is contributing more to the prediction then. So yeah, it is sort of blind to what, what goes. Yeah, and I think, uh, Ryan, your question is is a really ambitious one. It's probably not one we're going to achieve in this project. Like, can you can you remove the, <laughs> the ge geographical component with just a with with variables that you identify? And I think that's a huge challenge, right? So, um, but I think it's a fun theoretical exercise because, like, that variance essentially to me there captures what we don't know. Um, yeah. like. So space is uncertainty <laughs> like yeah, yeah. That, that's that's fair um ellison you had your hand still up is it is it still up or you have a new question and then right duel after that nope that's a byproduct of forgetting i had it up sorry right duel go ahead yeah uh, i have a quick question so i'm assuming from our discussion is that if I'm interested in a particular indicator, like say, for example, income or say energy expenditure, uh, we'll be able to extract data based on human level description, right? And, and if so, is that indicator like more static or is that more granular like household level variability? Or a probability distribution? That's something I was interested in. Uh, like, Mm -hmm. so, so, well, income by definition in the ACS is like a continuous variable. So when we summarize it at the Puma level, you would get a household, you know, mean, median, uh, whatever metric you want. But, you know, you could also break it up into groups and then you'd get probabilities or the fraction of households present in like each category. So we can slice it into groups or you could have it as like a continuous distribution as well. So yeah, we could do both. 
yeah is that the same for other indicators as well or like specific to income uh i did like for example race right so race is categorical in about five or five or seven categories so then you'd get fraction of let's say white households in a puma like fraction of mm. black identified households so things like that so it just depends uh if the variable is categorical or if it's you know continuous yeah so this is part of the discussion that I want to have in our modeling meeting on Tuesday, and it's going to get down farther, I think, into the nitty gritty. Um, and so I, I'd like to reserve that meeting too for figuring out how we would do this. Kartik and I had a, a very simple method for extracting data where I would send him a spreadsheet with the names of the variables, and then I would flag the ones I wanted. Um, but I think one of the things we want to talk about is correlations within a Puma because that's where some of the heterogeneity comes in. So um, so I think that we're going to have a party on that on Tuesday. Um, and I'm not saying don't ask questions, right, Dual. I'm just saying that, that, that some of those really detailed questions yeah. for communication to the model, we're going to have to handle in an, in a forum where we can talk about fields and uh, correlations and stuff. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, thank you. All right, Tammy, so I just, because I don't want to have the discussion here, obviously, but I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I just want to think about it before we talk about it next week. Okay. Um, looking for correlations within Pumas for what variables, for what purpose? So, so let me give an example. Um, Kartik currently gives me an average income and he gives me perhaps a range of house sizes or house types, but for a single Puma, that average income is associated with all house types or sizes. And presumably there would be some correlation between say house size and income. Mm -hmm. uh, so it being able to represent heterogeneity in the model is is going to depend on some of those correlations because if we have somebody with a average income of a puma making decisions with the operating energy of a very small house then it we might not get a, a reasonable answer okay yeah we may need to talk about a systematic way of doing that maybe using clustering clustering techniques or something okay okay i, I get the idea yeah thanks so one thing that I do want to do today in our remaining 20 minutes or so is give everybody a chance to say, how might this data set be useful for you and your work? Um, and it could be very broad. Like, don't, don't imagine you have to be a data scientist. But so if you would want to know where something occurs, for example, um, that, that might be a question to Kartik. And... I feel like Kartik's been doing a lot of presentations about the work he's been doing, and we've talked less about how it integrates with any specific uh, task that the, the rest of us are doing. And I just want those things to be in mind because this is the kind of data set where you can look at it and say, well, sure, we could do everything, but it doesn't mean that we are doing everything. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that Kartik is aware of what everybody might want from it as he's working with it. So just wanted to get all those things on the table. And and if I can just add to that while you're thinking, just for as a thought exercise in this meeting now, just uh, buy it all. Like assume that you buy the credibility of all these imputations. Yeah. The idea is to focus on the variables that are being imputed from other surveys because that's what's special about this. What's outside the ACS? What are the variables that interest you from the housing survey, the energy survey, the consumer expenditure survey, transport survey? Right, Stacy, do you wanna ask your, your question that you just put in the chat? I, I was sort of thinking about this question and then Tammy, you were sort of also saying like, yes, and what are the sorts of questions that would be helpful to the research and I, did not mean to time that in the same way, but something that I've just been wondering about with 
the presentation so far is like, what, what are the sort of questions that researchers could be asking for this data set to then be useful to answer? And I think that that's something that I'm struggling with. And maybe that's just because I'm neither in the research side asking the questions and I'm more outside of the entire process. Um, um, and then as a fun question, I was like, what's the best chance, you know, based on all of this data, what's like, what's the sweet spot? Who is like, who do you predict? What, what are the characteristics of a household that is predicted to have like the best probability of well-being? I don't know, that was sort of fun. Mm -hmm. And if that group is so small, are we all screwed? <laughs> like the rest of us. No, that, that's a very interesting question. And I think something that we've been working on. So one of the questions is, you know, can you consume less and still be, mm. still do well? So mm. we've been trying to identify lifestyles, for example, that will help you sort of maximize your well-being and at the same time sort of have lower consumption metrics overall. So one of the questions is like, for example, can you consume only five megawatt hour, you know, yearly instead of 25 and still have the same quality of life? And then, and then we are trying to say, yes, there's certain lifestyle choices. So depending on your you know, house size, your family type, uh, whether you're living in a city or you know, in a rural area, like the combination of these factors can help you lead a lower consumption lifestyle and still maintain your quality of life. So yeah, so that is something that we've been thinking of as well using you know these data sets. So yeah, that's a pretty valid question. And then I think there is an answer. So I think along similar lines, uh, somebody who's not a researcher might might ask, okay, what does this mean for me? Should I do something or move to a place where I have transport access and I'm not sure that your data set answers that or do you think that there's a possibility and a a corollary is how we might use it in the project if we find that a certain thing changes um, as part of a, a dynamic model for example could we say that it would be associated with a change in well-being and I think that's the the whole big question of the project right mm -hmm. so yeah again everything i say is just correlation so i just say something is correlated with something so yeah, that's a caveat but yeah so for example one of the questions we've been asking is does your overall life quality change if you're facing some sort of energy insecurity right so and what we find is that you take a big hit on your life satisfaction if you're facing uh, some sort of energy insecurity in terms of, you know, facing disconnections or just having discomfort in your house. So what we've been trying to study is, yeah, do these things have any link to your well-being? And then we've been finding that, yes, there is some sort of a correlation. So, so yeah, so yes, if you're if you're not facing food insecurity, your overall life quality is is going to go up. It's, could be one of the findings. Allison, did you want to say anything about how these, the things that are measured in Fusion ACS might or might not connect to the well-being review or the framing that you're doing? Yeah, I was trying to come up with a question. I was looking at our our sort of working document. I'm not sure that my, the question that I have in mind right now though is, yeah, I'm not yet sure if the question I have is directly related to that review, but I might ask it anyway, because I think it it may be. I think something that you have said a couple times, Karthik, has, is helping me say the question I have, which is if someone, like if you say, um, if someone's facing energy insecurity, 
that that has a significant impact on their well-being. And so addressing that, um, the corollary might be that then their well-being increases when that energy insecurity is removed. Same thing for food insecurity. And I think what comes to my mind is there, I believe there's a node somewhere and that these are two different things like meeting the need versus like fulfilling the flourishing version of that need are are separate for energy in my mind and separate in my mind for food. And I, I would argue for housing. So I'm, I guess as you've been talking, I, I'm wondering about like, I think nonlinearity or inflection points, because I think those breakpoints, Tammy, to me, that's what relates to the system, the, the review that we're doing a well-being representation. I think right now we don't have a good way of communicating a distinction between meeting a need to a minimum that does alleviate some of the well-being detriment. I'm not saying this very well. But I think in our, like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not saying this very well. Does your analysis get at an, a, a point of inflection, though, for any of the I don't know the word. Um, I'm thinking of them as needs, Tammy, but mm -hmm. um, they're not in terms of the needs we've talked about, but like need for housing, need for food, need for energy. So, I mean, if I can jump in while the yeah. context you're thinking, I mean, yeah, I, I totally get your question. I totally of interest. That's exactly what I've been interested in trying to tease out of this. It's difficult because, you know, Karthik has done a lot of, uh, correlation between these deprivations and subjective well-being, and you you know he does see distinct uh, differences in the life satisfaction scores of populations that are energy insecure and those that are not. If you consider that, that could be a threshold in the sense that those who say they are energy insecure are not satiated in terms of comfort, and those that say they don't say they are not are assumed to be satiated, and you do see differences. The problem is. Life satisfaction is determined by so many factors. We can't isolate the causation of that energy insecurity. And he has run regressions. We've tried to put in controls. And one question is, what do we, you know, there's omitted variable bias. And the second is, you're dealing with someone in a synthetic data set. So how, can we, are those inferences completely defensible? And so we are working on methodological approaches to working with imputed data sets to in incorporate that uncertainty into the error bars for the regression analysis. Okay, so we can do that, but we can't get around the fact that in the regression, we can control for only the variables we have in there, right? And so, so I do think that's val 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 valuable and valid, and that's kind of the paper Karthik is trying to write that we are trying to formulate right now, is exactly that, is can we link these deprivations and show that what do people think about their own, you know, <laughs> well-being given these conditions? And it looks like they definitely are less satisfied with their lives when they have these deprivations, but we can't be 100% sure that that's the reason why, you know? But I still think it's a paper worth writing, and so we are writing it. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, you know, yeah, the question is, are there specific variables, like the well-being variables? Clearly, I think you've shown interest, Ryan has shown interest, what can we try to do if we just buy it? If we buy it, that we have an imputation of subjective well-being for all the Colorado respondents of ACS. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say we have that. <laughs> what would you do with that? That's one question. That's one way to turn around this. You know, it's like, let's say you have that. And you also have, you know, energy insecurity for a broader sample. Uh, people who say they're not comfortable at home, you know? And we can even look at the web low, you know, potentially we'll have track level estimates. So what would we do if we if we had that and we actually buy it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the question here is we know that there are limitations in the conclusions that you're drawing and yet how do we wisely use them because this is the large data set that we have. This is as good as we're going to do, right? In terms of 
creating a, a data set with a lot of pieces. Um, and, and so is it, it, can it be useful? And what are the limitations of that utility? And can we still share some things with, with a list of cautions? I'd like, I think I had, I had, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and well, after you speak, uh, Kartik, I'd like to hear from Chris. Okay. Yeah, listen, I think I had a different interpretation of your question because I was thinking about, you know, is there a difference between insecurity and comfort, maybe? Because like, then there's like different thresholds and maybe at those different levels, the hit on your life satisfaction is perhaps different. So, yeah, I don't know how we'd get to that, but yeah, that is what I've been thinking about. So if you're at you know, the bottom end of the distribution, most definitely energy insecurity is going to be a bigger hit on your life satisfaction. But perhaps as you move upwards, maybe mm -hmm. your definition of insecurity and comfort is different. So maybe yeah, the relationship is different somehow. But yeah, I don't know how we would capture that. But yeah, that, that is what I've been sort of thinking about based on you know what you were trying to describe earlier. Yeah, I appreciate that. I could follow up later. I think I'll turn it over to Chris since Tammy had suggested that. Yeah, Chris, you would probably have a totally different take on it, so I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm not positive yet um, what I'm thinking of in terms of uh, how we could use the data for what we've collected so far with the interview material only because, you know, the it, obviously this stuff focuses a lot on insecurities and I, we, it's hard to really talk about what we've gathered so far in terms of insecurities uh, with the interviews only because you know, they were more or less uh, interviewing anybody that will sign up. And a lot of the people have a certain level of economic well-being already or else they wouldn't be able to um, pay out of pocket, right, for uh, some of the changes they've made. Um, I feel like if we were to target a population of people, you know, who have gone through assistance programs – maybe it's a little bit of a different uh, story, but I'm not, I'm not sure yet how, how it can be weaved in with the interview data, but I'm definitely open to um, what anybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, oh, Sarah has a hand up. Uh, I have my question about the use of this fusion ACS data set for my work. Uh, Karting, my work is uh, at house level, uh, uh, household level. And I was wondering if I, uh, for instance, provide house size or house age or something like this, can I get an overview of well-being indicator at what granula granulity, um, like Puma's tracks, Sara, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Sorry, I wanted to stop you for a minute um, because I wanted Kartik to have an opportunity to answer mm -hmm. Chris's question. I thought, I'm sorry, I thought you were, uh, you had a question that contributed to what Chris was saying. So I, I'm really sorry for interrupting you and yes. cutting, but I want to, I want to allow that train of thought to finish before you bring in your question. Sorry, sorry. No, I said answer both. Try to answer both. Uh, I think Chris, I'm just wondering. Because the way we define insecurity here is, you know, it's pretty broad. So, for example, the way we define energy insecurity is, you know, people who've uh, foregone other expenses so that they can pay their bills, or households that have like faced a disconnection in the past, or people who have their house, you know, just at a unhealthy temperature. So I was just wondering if any of those ever came up during your interviews and if, you know, if you could sort of 
use that as a starting point to sort of make a connection between you know what we have and uh, what you've been working with yeah i think that's quite possible certainly um some of the people who plenty of the people actually who have made the changes have been talking about why they made that change in terms of um overall uh discomfort um yeah i think i i just need to you know think about it a little bit more um yeah i uh, I think we can work around it that way a little bit more. Because, yeah, for those households, you know, because on our end, we could pull out a lot of social demographic features of, you know, households that have reported these issues. So, yeah, there's a lot of room on our end to play with these things. So, yeah, you could, just, yeah, we can discuss this once you've got a chance to reflect a little more. And yeah. Did you have some, yeah. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say maybe even I, you know, attending one of your meetings would be helpful um, at some point just to talk a little bit more about how, um, you know, again, what we're finding here and how your stuff can work with it. I want to. Yeah. Well, it looks like Ryan also wants to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, Ryan, do you have something to follow on? On, on this line of of questioning did i read re i don't think i left my hand no <laughs> sorry i was okay. i was reading into an expression sorry i uh, oh. I, I do have something to follow up on this uh tammy well, i think zaro's hand was up before yours and i want to let her talk um or, or are you following up on this yeah 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 um, but if we're running out of time i can we can talk offline with chris that's fine well, zara go ahead you have something brief to say, Narasimha, and then we can follow up. It sounds like Chris should attend. We should devote a modeling meeting to Chris because I see a lot of perhaps connections. Um, and so maybe we should just do a, a focused meeting on on that. What's coming out of the interview? How could it connect to Fusion ACS data? And what is missing from Fusion ACS data that could allow us to leverage? Yeah, that's yeah, that's what kind of what I was saying. Just one sentence. I wanted to just say that if, if Chris, you are able to code your interviews, you know, get a bunch of variables, you know, uh, out as much as you can, that's systematic across the interviews, that would be helpful to have that conversation. Because the idea would be to try and find your households in our data set. You know, it's like as if, can we generalize if we actually believe we can match them, then we maybe have a bigger population of similar households uh, from which we can draw additional data. Okay. Um, and so Zara, um, last question then. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, okay. Uh, Karthik, considering what you said in answer to Ryder question, I was wondering if I, for instance, provide a house size or house age or the number of occupants, uh, mm -hmm. At what level uh, I get the well-being indicator overview, something output like uh, related to well-beings from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the geographical uh, level would be at the Puma level at this point. Mm -hmm. But then, so for example, you could get, you would get, yeah, for a given house size, this is the average like well-being indicator uh, in this Puma. But then for the other, characteristics and demographics, you could slice it even further, right? So you could be for a given household size and race, what is the well-being indicator? So you could tag along other heterogeneity variables, but the geography would uh, be the Puma level at this point. So you could get any combinations that, you know, I show up there. So you could combine you know, race and house size and occupation, for example, and ask what is the well-being indicator for that combination at the Puma level. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And I think this will come up in our next modeling meeting too, because we, and as well in our meeting next week where Ray Dulzara and I talk about what 
we are doing because that should show how we're drawing or might draw data from Fusion ACS. So I encourage everyone to think about, continue thinking about how to draw on this data set and also how to um, how to make known what is needed from the data set because that this is the purpose of us all being in the same team is that the, we we have the power to request changes or to suggest changes or to identify what's useful. Um, and ultimately, the goal is something like what Stacy said, right? To figure out what's the best the the best way to achieve well-being, or at least, and and I guess this is like much, much less ambitious to determine uh, whether the kinds of changes that we look at are associated with changes positive or negative in well-being. So please keep thinking about how to draw on this rather than it just being something that Kartik presents as a fait accompli. Uh, Narasimha is in charge of the modeling meetings Tuesdays at eight o'clock. Adam has issued a request to, to be a fly on the wall sometimes there. Um, can you put him on the list when you make announcements, Narasimha? Would you be willing to do that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I can just uh, let the whole group know, and anyone's welcome to join. I think Ryan also, at some point, we should have a discussion, oh. you know, to see how we can combine your local data set with ours. Sure. So you can just send the modeling announcements to the whole team, and those who are yeah, that's what I'll do. Not interested, cannot, uh, don't need to join. And it's the same link, the respect link that we use on Fridays. And we will be meeting next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Mountain Time. Yep. Cool. I will send an email out. More in the weeds of the models discussion. So just be aware. That's why we haven't been inviting everybody because sometimes it's like if you're not into data, it's super boring. Who's not into data? Brian, <laughs> be inclusive. Lots of people are not into data. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, hey. Can you hear me? I was on mute. I can hear you now. Yeah, I'm trying to save the chat and I'm failing. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> Oh, I was going to see if you had a couple of minutes after this meeting. It's okay if you don't. I have a couple of minutes till 10. I've got to be, I have to get dressed and get to campus and be in class speak at 1050. So <laughs> oh, well, no, no, we can, let's catch up or let's, let's talk another time. I, I know we're still recording. So okay. Stop recording. Cut off. <laughs>